Good morning. Welcome to Wyckoff Assembly of God or International Church Online. We're so glad you joined us today and happy Father's Day. We're so glad that God has a plan for each one of our lives. He directs our lives, He guides our lives, and He, he leads us through things that we may not understand. You know, we talk about Father's Day. Our greatest Father is our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father that watches over us, Heavenly Father that guides us, directs us, all those things. He says He's there for us. It's hard to believe that sometimes when we go through difficulties and struggles, but He's still there because His Word says He is. And He's not going to leave us or forsake us. Sends, us. sends the Holy Spirit to help and guide us along because Jesus is now gone to be with the Father according to Scripture. And we know that God has a plan for our lives. Yes, he knew you in your mother's womb, but he also had a plan for you from the beginning of time. And he wants to literally minister to your life today and touch you in a very special way. I know you've tuned in because maybe you need strength or maybe you just want to worship the Lord with us. We just want to encompass that all those thoughts and all those feelings and, and just worship the living God today because he's alive and well. We're thankful that my God is alive and well. Why don't you join us today as we worship in truth. Part of worship is our giving unto the Lord, our first fruits unto him. That's right, our first fruits unto him. And we give unto God in, in abundance to to what he has done for us. We give our first fruits, which is our, our giving our first uh, income or first part of that income that God has given unto us. And I'm so thankful that he has blessed me, he has blessed you, he has blessed so many of us. And I pray today that God will bless you in ways that you would understand. Maybe you're going through a difficult thing today. Maybe you're going through a situation where you've lost a father like I have. It's difficult. It's difficult. And you may not feel that all that great on Father's Day because your dad's not there. I understand that. But my God also is still there. And he sends the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he compasses around about you and he just wants to bring you that peace and that joy in the midst of this Father's Day. As we give our gifts unto the Lord, tithes and our offerings, as we begin to just worship him with our, our voices and our, our lifting our hands unto the Lord, all those things, all those things are part of our worship unto God because he's a God that loves you so much and cares about you so much. Heavenly Father, we ask today as we move into this time of worship and praise unto you, the Lord, you will just en encompass round about us with your presence in just a beautiful way. That we'll just know, God, that you're there, even though we may have gone through some difficulties and maybe we're celebrating Dad today at home or maybe we're celebrating Dad that's away today. Or maybe we're celebrating Dad that is, is far away today. God, maybe there's somebody there that has gone through a dad that really wasn't that loving, really wasn't that caring, maybe hurt them. Lord, I ask that you bring your peace and your comfort and your joy back into their life, but also, Lord Jesus, that you will just refurbish and, and redo all those things inside of their lives that need to be redone. Lord, there's some things that just need to be stripped away and taken away because of the hurt, bitterness, or whatever. Strip that away now. Bring the joy back. In Jesus' name we pray. One, Amen. Two, three, four. This is the day you have made. So I rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. So this is where I believe that you are more than enough, more than enough for me. You are faithful to your promise, you are strong. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 
do that one more time. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, my soul, bless his name. All that is within me say, the joy of the Lord, the joy of and be glad this is where I believe that you are more than enough more than enough for me you are faithful to your promise you are strong man
to let it rise up like a river overflow. Do you want to know the flow this morning? Holy Spirit, let it pour out with the limits overflowing. Yeah. 
sometimes don't be, seem enough to say how wonderful and marvelous you are. They're just words from finite minds. Lord, when we see you, when we see you face to face, when we see you on the throne in all of your glory and splendor, Lord, I'm pretty sure that there will be words we've never known that we will begin to say them because our finiteness would have dropped off. And we'll be there with you at your thrones. Oh, what a marvelous time that will be. But we want you to know before we get there that we are. We are, we are so appreciative and we want to give you our praise and our worship. We want you to know that we do believe you are the God of all gods. That everything must bow and everything is below you, below your name, below your feet, Lord God. That we may not act like that sometimes, Lord. But in our heart of hearts, we believe. You are the Lord God Almighty. You do not change. Our situations, our circumstances change, but you do not change. You are the same God that was there and spoke the world into order and creation. You're the same God that was there that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. You're the same God that gave the Ten Commandments and the mountain shook and the people were afraid. You're the same God that sent your son to earth. You're the same God that had to not look on him when he was on the cross. You're the same God today that you've been all of those times and you will be the same God tomorrow. You do not change. So Father, whatever it is that your people have need of today, I pray that as they reach out to you and, and worship you and bring healing to their bodies, peace to their minds, Lord, you bring a job to the one where the, the doors seem to all be shut. Lord, you have a job for that one that's been looking and searching. Lord, you put them at the right place. Put them at the right time, at the right place. And let them have favor on them, Lord God. And give them the job that you have for them. The Lord, the one that might be home in bed, sick. Stretch forth your hand and bring healing right now. Lord, I know of two people that are not here today because their home is sick. One is facing surgery this week, and I pray that you would go before that one and you would prepare the way. You have the power to heal before surgery, Lord God, because you are still the miraculous God and you are still the healer. But Lord, if some reason you choose to allow them to go through surgery, prepare the way. Be with them. God, that surgeon. Lord, speed the recovery and the healing process, I pray. Bring peace to their mind, Lord God. And I know of someone who's at home laying in bed, not able to get up. God, you know, you bring forth healing in that body right now in Jesus' name. Whatever that issue is, release that pain from that body and bring healing. Lord, there are people suffering so from cancer. Seems like it's gone, it comes back, it raises its ugly head again. Lord, in the name of Jesus, cancer has to bow to the name of Jesus. It is time we begin to see cancer being dried up, cells being dried up, and just released out of those bodies. It's time we see tumors begin to disappear off the x-ray, off the MRI. It's time that all those lesions be healed in Jesus' name. Release those bodies 
and bring forth miraculous healing in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We're going to hear about victory in those situations. Lord, for the family that's laying someone to rest today, bring them comfort and strength. Lord, you know, you see farther down the road than we do, and we, may, we don't understand, but you are still the God who brings comfort and bring peace right now, I pray, to their hearts. Lord, may they see your hand guiding somehow in this terrible situation because you are God and you do not change. And Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We know that you still are going to continue to hover over the servants. And whatever it is that we need from you, bring it forth to us today. In your name we pray. And we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. We're reading from a passage this morning, but I have some information for you. It says, The generous soul will be made rich. To give and to receive is a biblical principle. Do not give because you expect to receive. Give because you have a generous heart. Trust and wait on the Lord for his blessings. Amen. Father, as we gather here this morning to worship and praise you, Lord, we offer our prayers up to you, Lord, and in return, you show down your blessings, Lord, and on all who are gathered here this morning. Give comfort to those who need to be comforted, healing to those who need healing. And Lord, as we give a portion unto you this morning, let us use it to further your kingdom, and further your church, in your holy name we pray. Happy Father's Day once again, and today we are celebrating Father's Day. And Father's Day is one of those days that over the years has not always been the most celebrated for many, many reasons. And I think part of the reasons have been that men have not stood up to the place where they need to be the father they need to be. I'm thankful I had a great father. I'm thankful for my father that, that instilled upon me things. Now that doesn't make me perfect. It doesn't make him perfect. But we strive to be the person that God wants us to be. And my thought today is not just for fathers, but <clears throat> for women also and men both, both alike. Uh, uh, be the person of God that God wants you to be. And I want to take a, a passage of scripture that uh, is shared with us in the Old Testament there. It's, it's about David. We've all heard the story of David, but I want to look at it maybe in a little different way. I'm not going to deal with all of David's life, but I want to deal with a couple of things in there. First of all, David was chosen as the least. Where do you get the least from, Pastor West? Well, let's look at Scripture. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 through 13 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, now Samuel is the prophet, the prophet that's going to anoint whoever the next king is. This is his job. This is what God has asked him to do because, you know, the people wanted... King Saul, and King Saul did not turn out to be a godly man at all, whatsoever. And they got what they asked for, basically. But he's looking for someone to take his place. And God's got somebody in mind. And when God has somebody in mind, he, he looks at a different viewpoint than we look at. So in 1 Samuel 16, 7, we find that uh, God directs Samuel to go out and find the next king. And he gives some instructions to him. He says, don't look at his appearance or how tall he is. Because I rejected him. In other words, he's talking about, I rejected that tall guy that you're thinking about. And he says, God does not see as humans see. Humans look at the outward appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. Then Jesse, uh, now he's the, he's the father of David, uh, brought him, uh, brought Abinadad to, and brought him to Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse had Shemama and, and came to Samuel and the rest of the brothers come on to Samuel and they, they go through all these and, and then Samuel says this, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest one, Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. Samuel told Jesse, 
send someone to get him. We won't continue until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him, and he had a healthy complex complexion, attractive eyes, and a an handsome appearance. The Lord said, Go ahead, anoint him. He is the one. Samuel took the flask of oil, olive oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers, and the Lord's Spirit came over David and stayed with him from that day on. Then Samuel left for Ramah. Now, there are some characteristics there that we would look at. And not, number one, he's not popular. They didn't even bring him before this appearance, you know. And when he's going down there and get the guys out here, we're going to look at him. We're going to figure out who's going to be the next king. You know, everybody has their own idea. But it's not God's idea. He has attractive eyes, handsome appearance, healthy complexion. Uh, but he wasn't called to be in the lineup and not thought of as a king. But God says he does not, we do not, he does not see as the humans see. In other words, we don't, we don't see God's viewpoint. We don't understand how God looks at things. But God says this, the Lord looks into the heart. Now, David is one of these guys that he's been doing the family business for a while, doing the family business and doing several things. But David finally gets a, a, a job outside of the family business. And instead of tending sheep, uh, there's a problem with King Saul, and, and David's going to fill that void that needs to be filled there. And 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, verse 14, says this, Now the Lord's spirit had left Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now, we, we look at that and we said, does God send out evil spirits? Well, it's like God takes us off his, his umbrella of protection. He takes off his, his, his way of protecting them and, and says, okay, I'm not going to deal with this. And Saul literally had rejected God, injected God's ways, and, and not followed after God. So God says, no, you, you're not the guy. You're not the guy. And, you know, there's, there's going to be some tormentation. And God often sends things that, or allows things to come our way that will begin to torment us or begin to cause us to go back towards God. That's God's way of dealing with it. We'll feel uncomfortable about it. We won't begin to understand about it. And, and Saul's officials told, told uh, King Saul, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Your majesty, why don't you command us to look for a man who can play the lyre well? And when the evil spirit from God comes to you, he'll strum a tune and you'll feel better. In other words, this, this melodic tune will begin to calm your spirit, calm your spirit. Now, David was used to that kind of stuff. He, he'd oftentimes played for the sheep and been out there with, with those things. That's where he learned how to play and lots of time, and he would learn how to play. And David knew, and David worshiped God, and David was a worshiper of God. So Saul told his officials, please find me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the officials said, I know of a of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem, who can play well. He is a courageous man and a warrior. He has a way with words. He is handsome, and the Lord is with him. I have to laugh the word handsome there. When you're talking to the king, well, the king didn't want to look at something that would make him feel disturbed, so he had to look at something handsome. So this, this king who was off in this left field had to have something that would calm his spirit. Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Jesse took uh, six, bushel, six bushels of bread and a, a full wineskin and young goat and sent them with his son David to King Saul. In other words, you're sending gifts. That's your way of uh, entrance into the king. That's what you did. David came to Saul and served him. Saul loved him very much, and David was his arm bearer. Saul sent his message to Jesse, Please let David stay with me because I have grown fond of him. Whenever God's spirit came to Saul, David looked, took the lyre, and strummed a tune, and Saul got relief from his terror and felt better, and the evil spirit left him. You know, this, this, this whole thing about when, when, when God's spirit departs from you, there's, there's a tormentation that comes because God's not there with his presence to keep you calm. And so when God's presence is not with you, there becomes this, this total opposite feeling, totally opposite all the way through. The Spirit of God had departed from King Saul. The evil spirit had tormented him, and David's first job literally was playing for the king. I mean, you can't get any better than that. But think about this. David had no training. David had no degree in therapy. He didn't have a doctor degree to do PT. 
He had no psychological training or courses in human relations, but he was hired to soothe the king as he strums a tune. Simple as that. His training was playing and working with a bunch of sheep. He would learned how to work with the sheep, protect the sheep, and go with the sheep, and do all those things. Learning to use your talent to the best of your ability is what God looks for. God looks for what you have developed and what you're willing to do. You know, I, I was listening to this thing the other day that uh, this poll taken about uh, what employers say recently about college graduates and job interviews. During job interviews, employees say recent college graduates have 53% struggle with eye contact. In other words, they can't look their employer in the eye. 50% ask for unreasonable compensation. 47% dressed inappropriately. I don't see David doing any of those things. 27% uh, used inappropriate language. 21% refused to turn on the camera during a Zoom or virtual interview. 19% brought a parent to the interview. <laughs> David wasn't trained, but he knew how to use his talent. You notice that David's dad didn't even go to the interview, didn't even go there with him, but he set the things he needed with him. David had the right heart, though. That's what counted. David had the right heart. How do we know that? That started when, when, when literally God was looking for the king to be the next king. And he sent the, the prophet in there and says, okay, you know, you go in and check it out. And, and uh, I'll tell you when it is. And I'll tell you when you find the right person. So Samuel had done all those things. And, but he found this guy, David, and he had a right heart. David used to calm uh, an angry leader. He used a simple harp or leer type of harp that would calm this angry leader. David worked with a jealous leader. We'll talk about that some other time. David seized the opportunity to simply calm the beast inside of King Saul. Verse 18 there says, one of the officials said, I know one of the sons from Bethlehem who can play well. He is a courageous man, a warrior, and he has a way with words. He is handsome and the Lord is with him. All those things were going for him. He said, well, I'm not the most handsome person. It's not about being handsome. It's about all those things about what you, God is taking, what talent you have, and using it for his glory. He's a courageous man, a warrior. Later on, we find that David brags about he's killed a lion and a bear. He has a way with words. He could talk, smooth talker, very, very easy to talk to. Just a simple, simple talk. How did he learn how to talk? Well, he probably talked to the sheep a lot. He has a way of words, handsome, takes care of himself, makes sure he's dressed well for the interview, makes sure that he dresses appropriately, makes sure that he's, he's using the, the appropriate language even. The Lord was with David all the way through. Now, during David's time of being hired on by the king and, and being there, and, and the king was asked for David to be there, David picks up a side job. That's right, David picks up a side job. You said, well... How did, how, did, how, did, how did David pick up a side job? What, what side job is that? Well, you know, there was this little war going on there with the Philistines. And, and as they were in war, his, David's brothers were out there fighting, fighting the Philistines. As they were fighting Philistines, they sent uh, a delivery boy, David, just to deliver some cheese. Delivery boy, take this, this up to the 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 front of the battle and, and just deliver these to your brother. Your brothers can use some extra strength right now. And so David sees the moment to fight for the honor of God and, and, and begin to work with all that. He didn't use all the excuses that we oftentimes hear. He didn't talk about, that's not my job. I don't get paid for that. I don't get hazard paid for that. And I shouldn't even have to be doing this. David's only job was to bring cheese, a snack for his brothers. He didn't say, well, this is below me. He didn't say, this is not my thought here. This is not what God has trained me for. This is not what I'm supposed to be. After all, I've been anointed as a king, so I shouldn't have to do any of this stuff whatsoever. David didn't do any of that stuff. David gets there. And as David gets there, he's very disturbed with what he's hearing. Extremely disturbed with what he's hearing. And David presents himself as one who could kill Goliath. But he's been tending sheep. He's been doing everything else, but he has the heart of God. God sees the heart inside of him and says, yeah, that lines up to what I'm looking for. 
And see, when your heart lines up to what God is looking for, God will use you to do all sorts of other things. Our heart gets disturbed when all of a sudden we say, well, God, that's not my job, and, and I don't get paid for that, and God, that's below my, my, my pay grade, and I'm not even going to go out there and even begin to think about that because, God, they, they're just asking too much. I don't need to dress up for this interview, and God, I don't need to go through all these other things, and, and because I've done all this in my life already, I should get this, this salary right here. This is what I should be getting. That's not what God's asking you for. God's asking, first of all, is your heart right? And as your heart's right, are you willing to do the things that God wants you to do? Man of God, are you, is your heart right? Woman of God, is your heart right? Are you going to be that mom or that dad or that, that aunt or that uncle? Or are you, are you going to begin to, to, to literally be the one that demonstrates what life is really all about and, and how you begin to reach out beyond? 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 37 says this. <clears throat> When it turned to me, I seized it by the hair, st struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. In other words, he says, you know, I've done this in my past. I've, I've, I've killed a lion and a bear both. I've taken them both on and I've, I've struck them and killed them. I seized them by their hair, just hooked it onto them. I wasn't afraid of them one bit. And I was ready to take them on. And he says, I can go ahead and kill Goliath. I could do this. Why does he want to do that? Because he's protecting Almighty God. And when you begin to do the things in your job, when you begin to do the things in society, when you begin to take on the extra jobs that maybe you're not even getting paid for that, whatever it is, if you're doing it for the glory of God, that makes all the difference in the world. Maybe they've defiled the, the armies of the Lord thy God. Maybe they've defiled who God is. Maybe they've taken on all sorts of stuff. Are you still willing to take a foot forward and say, you know, this is who I serve. This is the God that I serve. This is who God is. And I want to I serve God in a real way. God gives you the confidence to be beyond your occupation. Delivery boy becomes a warrior, becomes a warrior. At first Philippians, I mean, Philippians, first chapter, verse six says this. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. God has done something. He's already started something in you. God started something in David and began to look at that, anointed him with oil to be the king, but there were some things he was going to have to go through first before he became that king. Let me tell you, my friend, be an advocate or promoter for God. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are not like that. You are a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong in God. Do those things. So be the advocate, be the promoter of God. Be that one that stands up for the way that you believe that God wants you to be. I know that God's got a plan for your life. And I know that in God's plan for your life, he's called you. It may be some side jobs here. It may be some side directions he's taking you. But in those things, he's called you to be the things that he wants you to be. Are you willing to do that? David only took on a little side job of being a delivery boy. And in the midst of his delivery boy, he literally freed Israel of the biggest persecution they had faced in a long time. It was called Goliath. It was called Goliath. You know, they still look at the, that, at the David killing Goliath story. All of Israel still talks about it. They still remember that. I was, I was there in Israel, and we were up on the mountainside uh, or hillside where we overlooked, you know, the, the, the valley where David killed Goliath. And there was a, a bunch of soldiers that had run up and down this hillside several times. That was part of their their regiment that day and what they were going through, their exercises they were going through that day. And the, the bus driver for us had been a tank driver in the Israel army. And he walked over to them and he began to talk to them. And he reminded them once again that, that this is the place where David killed Goliath. Sitting over near, nearby was a, was a rabbi that I went over and talked to with another 
friend of mine, and we began to talk to the rabbi through an interpreter and began to t understand that. The rabbi says, we bring the, bring the boys up here and the girls up here all the time to remind them that the greatest warrior that we remember has been David. And David killed Goliath. And we asked them, are you willing to be that David? My friend, are you willing to be that servant of God that God's called you to be? Whether it's David, maybe it's somebody else, that you, another character in the Bible that you're looking after, whatever it is, are you willing to do that? David believed in God so much that he was willing to risk his life for God. Colossians 1, verses 11, 13 says, We are also prayed that you will be strengthened in all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with the joy Always thanking the Father, he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light, for he has rescued you from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us in the kingdom of his dear, his dear son. David was not ashamed of who God was and who God is and who God would be in the future. David was not ashamed of God. But don't mess with, 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 with God's stuff because David says, you know, you don't mess with these guys. David said, because he has defiled the armies of the living God, because he has done that, because you messed with my God, my God's people, because you did that to my God's people, then, then, then we're on. War's on. Because you messed with God's people, we're going after this thing. We're going to take care of this thing. Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ, for it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us that God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished, this is accomplished from start to finish by faith, as the scripture says. It is through faith that a righteous person has life. David had the heart of God, and that's where it started. In David's heart of God. You know, you say, Pastor West, we already found that in the beginning part there, that part about being the heart of God. Well, take a look with me, would you? Over to Acts, the 13th chapter, verses 20 through 23, it says this. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. That's what Scripture says. So when you think that it's only about you, it's about your descendants also, it's about the impression and, and this of, of what you're going to do here, it's about how you're going to affect other lives, it's how you're going to affect the legacy that you're leaving behind, all those things. Let me ask you a question today, if I could. How would you describe your heart today? How would you describe your heart today? Is it, is it more than a heart of compassion? Is it more than an activist for society? Is it more than one who sympathizes or pities others? Is it more than that? Is it a heart that reaches far beyond your even desires? Sometimes we say it's all about our heart. Well, the Bible also teaches the heart can deceive you. Heart can deceive you. How do we get that heart in the right relationship? I get in the right relationship because I begin to follow after God, follow after his principles, and follow out what he desires me. Later on, David messes up. He, he, he didn't quite get things right, and it cost him greatly. But here in the beginning, here in the first part of his life, he's following after God. God says, he's a man after my heart. He's a man after Mark. Can, can you actually say today that you're a person after God's own heart? Are you a man or woman after God's own heart? Are you that person? I want to give you the opportunity right now to say, God, just come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Change my heart, oh God. Change the inside of me. Change, change what begins to move to the outside. Change this, this inner being of me. And begin to help me look at things differently. Change my heart to be the righteous heart that you desire, God. Come in and forgive me of all my sins. 
Change me now, God. All you have to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. I am so sorry for all my sins, and I ask that you forgive me and change my life, God. Turn me a new direction, God, in you. And he'll begin to do that. And then, Lord, I also pray for those that, that have followed after you, that, that keep getting off track here a little bit, and maybe even their hearts got a little bit off track. They need to go back to that original thing that the Lord, you began to impress on them years ago. There's some things, God, you've called them out to do, and they have not done them yet. Maybe there's some fear going on there. Maybe there's some other situations. Yet, yeah, God, you have called them. Maybe they're having a problem with a job, or maybe they're having a problem with something else, and, and they're not getting things back on track where it needs to be. Maybe they looked at other things as being more important than what, God, you had called them to do. So, Lord, help them to do that now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Father's Day. And have a blessed week in Jesus.